Time now for another keynote presentation. Please welcome the Managing Director at CS Ventures. His name is Ian Clark. Well, thanks, George, for that introduction. So I'm Ian Clark, and um, I'm going to talk today about attracting fans back to the stadium. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Yagumba people, and pay my respect to their elders, past and present. So today, I want to ask and answer three questions. Firstly, is there a crisis in Australian sport that's driving the fans away? What does make a good stadium experience? And finally, how can sports work with stakeholders to create a holistic experience for their fans? So this is me. Um, I've worked for some uh, great companies and also for the New South Wales government. And I've worked for several sporting organisations. And now um, CS Ventures focuses on early stage investments. That, of course, is only part of the story because, um, as you can see, I'm a bit of a football tragic. And I'm personally engaged with football um, on all levels of Australian football and as the director of Manly United. So here's sort of the, the bad news. So Australian sports attendance does seem to be in decline. Um, so what I've got here is the, um, the highest average attendance that's ever been achieved and how many fans in total that was, what the 2018 average was, and then how many games it is and what the total was so you can sort of see how that compares. And, and then what's the average growth rate per year that, that drives? So pretty much for all sports, the peak is in the past. So for AFL, the peak attendance was in 2008, and it's fallen since then, but only by a little bit, about half a percent a year. Um, cricket, the big bash, um, tremendous um, achievement in their first year, but then they dropped off last year by up nearly 15%, and it remains to be seen how they'll go this summer. Um, NRL's been declining um, since 2010 by about a percent, and the biggest decline there is Super Rugby, which is, um, it's nearly halved its uh, attendance numbers. Um, and I think that codes in, in some uh, serious trouble to try and bring those crowds back. And the A-League's decline about 5% a year over the last four years. But then you have basketball, which is, um, it's managed to increase its attendance. So clearly there's a bunch of different things happening here, and it's sort of not a, not a uniform trend. So maybe let's sort of dig a little deeper into that. So firstly, if you look at Australia on a global stage, we're actually doing really well. We have two of the top 10 most attended leagues in the world, um, despite obviously having a much smaller population than many of these countries up here. And in fact, the AFL, which is by any, um, by any definition an excellently managed sport, is achieving about 43% of the US um, NFL crowds with a much smaller population, and it's not even the biggest code in, in all areas of Australia. So what's going on here? Well, if we dig a little bit deeper, this is the AFL crowds. So yes, their average is in the past, but not really by much, and, and through that period, they've actually managed a significant expansion of their audience. Um, so the last one there is sort of expansion into Western Sydney. And um, they've done it not by going into sort of easy areas to go into. They've gone into heavily competed markets with their product. And they've actually done pretty well um, to, to maintain an audience. And I should add as well that um, and give them cre get AFL credit for the AFLW. So that's obviously started with a great, a great explosion, um, sold out their first game. Um, and it's all based around the, the stunning insight that all fans and all players have one thing in common, which is they all have mothers. So what they're actually doing here is they're growing the next generation of fans by engaging women directly in the sport and giving the youngsters role models that they can look up to. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the A-League as well. 
So here the average crowd fall is, isn't uniform. So there's something different going on. Um, some clubs have done really well. So Newcastle has, has grown its audience with the you know, old-fashioned route of playing good football. But also uh, Melbourne City and Perth Glory have, have done well as well to help, help their audience. A couple of the teams there, Sydney FC and the Wanderers, they've fallen, but a lot of that's to do with um, some, some dysfunction around their stadia. Um, Western Sydney's rebuilding its stadium, and, and I'll talk about Sydney's stadium in a sec. And then Brisbane Raw there, they've got some issues within the club. So this isn't a uniform trend. It's actually about something about what the clubs themselves are doing. And, and you can see there with Wellington and, and the Phoenix, they actually don't have particularly great markets that they're in. But if you put that to one side, it's not just about the markets, it's also about the execution. Um, and as you're probably aware, the A-League's thinking about an expansion, and um, David Gallup said, we're going to fish where the fish are. Right? It was a bit controversial, but it's in one sense, but not for a business. It's very simple. We're going to put the code into markets that can sustain a team. And when we, we dug into that, what we found is it's not just the markets. The execution in those markets uh, matters more. And you can see this with the experience of the A-League. So let me now turn to um, the stadia. And I've sort of picked three examples. Um, this is the good. So this is uh, Wembley Stadium in London. Um, it was rebuilt about 10 years ago. And crucially with this stadium, it was, it's owned by the FA, Football Association. Um, and, and they have complete control of the customer experience. So transport's great. It's um, close to three stations, and that's actually two train lines and two tube lines. So it's accessible from all parts of the country via the, via the main lines and also London via the tube system. Parking's very limited, so public transport is the way you get here. Um, and what they've created is um, an, a fan experience. So the, the picture down the, uh, the, the bottom right there, that's actually the walk down Wembley Way. And the arch is designed to be seen from a long distance away. So as you walk into the stadium, the excitement of, of the occasion and your presence there starts to build. It's been very well used. Um, it's, it's obviously England's um, home ground. Um, Spurs have been playing there. I think West Ham might uh, be signing a deal to play there. Um, there's other football codes, um, like the Americans have, have played there and stuffed the pitch up a bit, um, and other events and concerts. So it's a really key part of, really key piece of infrastructure in London, and it's been well used. And part of the reason is, I think, is that Wembley understands the business it's in. Business is about inspiring memories. Okay? It's about people wanting to go there and remembering for the rest of their life that they were there. So, so this is also an example. They've engaged EE to be their digital partner, um, and that controls all, all aspects of the digital presence. They want to be the most connected stadium in the world. Um, FF, the FA controls ticketing to the events. Um, and, more, and overall, it's got a clear, motivated owner that controls the end-to-end -end customer experience. And that includes even working with a transport network to um, ensure there's enough capacity to bring all the fans to the game, wherever that, those fans originate from. And obviously, recently, that has involved um, making sure there's a lot of transports being organized down from Manchester, so one of the Manchester teams can be in the finals. Here's a bad example. So this is uh, Qualcomm Stadio in San Diego. Um, it holds about 70,000 people, so that's sort of when it's full for a, a football game. Um, this is sort of what it looks like when it's empty. So it was built in the 60s, um, and it's owned by the city of San Diego, and it was built as a multi-sport venue, so they can also move things around and fit baseball in there. Um, you can see from this picture, it's built around the car, right? So that parking, that, that parking round, that's 16,000 parking spaces for a 70,000 stadium. And it's got um, access to two freeways, east, west, north, south. 
And if you sort of look carefully, there's a very rare site in California, which is a train station, is also in there. I'm not sure how much that's actually used, but it's there. Now, believe it or not, this was considered one of the worst stadia in the NFL. Um, and the club basically wanted it rebuilt by the city. Uh, it was very sort of close, closely run, but the city voted against that. And it's now become a stranded asset. So this sort of sits in San Diego, and it's kind of sterilized a big chunk of the city. So the city's grown up to it, and then it's grown out the other side, if you look on a map. Now, this sort of thing isn't really doable in Australian cities. We can't afford to give up this much land to a stadium, um, and we're going to have to use public transport rather than parking. Um, but it's an example of what can happen if the city planning isn't, isn't done right around a stadium. And finally, here's, here's the ugly. So this is um, Allianz Stadium in Sydney. So um, it was built in 1988. Um, it's now been closed um, to be redeveloped. And I think in a sense, it was a little bit unlucky. So 1988, for the people who were um, alive then, remember that, and I see there's probably a few of us in the room. Um, it was kind of a watershed year. Um, 1989, the Berlin Wall came down, the Cold War ended, China started developing, and the nature of Australia has sort of changed with that globalization as well. Um, so it's a little bit unlucky, but it's really got three major problems. So firstly, around the governance, um, it's got a fairly antiquated governance. So it's a trust owned, owned by members nominally, um, also known as a quango. So a quasi-autonomous, non-governmental organisation. Um, and those are kind of quite difficult because no one, no one really is, is totally in control of those. Um, and they've got this sort of weird system where the memberships are only $50, but you have to wait 20 years to get one. Or you can pay a, a platinum membership for $44,000. Um, I've never seen such an you know, extreme segmentation scheme. I'm not really sure what the, the thinking is behind that. And in theory, the, the members elect the, the trustees. Um, but what that effectively means is that the, the users of the stadium, both the, the sports um, and the fans, have little control over the end-to-end -end experience. And the trust themselves actually have little direct incentive to actually improve it and make it better. So that's sort of a problem. Um, the design of the stadium itself is a little bit bit bizarre. Um, so I've sort of pointed out those premium seats. So those are sort of windows. And behind there, there's a commercial kitchen and catering. And, and you can buy sort of tables for, you know, two, three, four thousand dollars to, to entertain at the game. But if it happens to be raining, you can see the seats are actually in the rain. So I went to an event there where everyone paid their money, but they actually watched the game crowded behind the glass because it was pouring down. Um, and those are obviously are halfway is where the best seats are, so on both sides, the best seats are in the rain. So I'm not sure what the thinking was, was behind that. Um, bizarrely, they also thought, being 1988, that, you know, who comes to games? Well, well men do, so we're not really going to need that many female loos here. So they didn't kind of plan for that, and obviously, you roll that forward, that becomes a bit of a problem. Um, you know, ticketing is controlled by Ticket Act. That's a problem. Um, and, you know, the, the food and drink is, is well overpriced um, and pretty average. And then there's transport. So the closest station is uh, three kilometres away, it's sort of off, off the map there to the left. Um, and three kilometres is kind of, it's not quite far enough to take a bus efficiently, but it's a little bit too far to walk. So it's probably the worst kind of distance that you'd, you'd want to have. Um, but the good news is a rail line was planned to hook up to this precinct, um, but it was planned in 1914 by Bradley um, and never built. Um, now, the better news is that the light rail will now connect um, central to this precinct, and that will open in um, 18 months or so. So, you know, about 100 years too late, we're going to get some, some uh, solid public transport to this, this site. Um, and then the parking's pretty shambolic as well. Um, that's in the neighbouring parklands, which is managed by another trust. Um, and um, if the stadium's full, the parking fills about 
half an hour to 45 minutes, so people who are coming kind of can't get a park. So um, that, that's the problem. Um, and then the, the final difficulty is that, as I said, it's, it's slated for redevelopment, but the opposition doesn't support that. So if Labor wins the election next year, there's a, there's a prospect that you know, it could get demolished and not have any money to be rebuilt. So hopefully that, that won't happen. Um, and you can see at many levels there's, there's been some sort of failures of planning in this. Now, I was fortunate to go to a, a presentation last week where, you know, there's a new hope. And that was the, the Western Sydney Stadium in Parramatta. Um, now, that's been built from the perspective of the fan back. Um, one of the architects uh, was a wallaby, um, and he went and... and did focus groups, looked at what the fans want. Um, and I think we'll talk about that a little bit more in the panel. So what's the answer to this? So as, as I've probably alluded to throughout this, sporting events should be an integrated experience. So the live experience is now competing with the lounge room. Um, so the journey, if it's a nightmare, is going to put people off. Um, to and from, and you've also got the pre and post game activity. So that includes everything like thinking about integrated ticketing and transport, making public transport work, getting the food and drink right, adding entertainment. Okay, so people are there a bit early, give them something to do. And then in the game, um, have good sight lines, think about the atmosphere. So the, the new stadia are going to have very steep um, sides. So the atmosphere is retained within the stadium and there's good, good sight lines and good viewing. Um, and, th and think about digital enhancement of the experience. So all, all the way through there, think about digital connectivity of your fans. Now I'll whisk through these last ones kind of quickly. So reality is most consumers would prefer to park and drive if they can. So, uh, we probably can't go the US solution, but think about integrating that. So, so on the uh, right there, there's, a, there's a, a promotion that the Rabbitohs ran where they integrated um, parking um, with a company called Share with Oscar, um, Mother's Day gift, and the tickets. So you know, dutiful fathers could bring their families along and keep you know, the wife happy at the same time. Um, but more importantly, it was a good experience because it was end-to-end. -end. You could know that you could drive there, that you knew where you were going to park, you knew that it was going to be a gift, there was going to be a bit of a show, and then you get to see the game. So that's, that's just an example of initiative that can, can help make that experience better. Um, public transport should be integrated, um, convenient and reliable. Um, that's a picture of the RBB in Parramatta, so they kind of come into the CBD on trains and buses, but then they walk together to the stadium. That's part of the culture that they've built. Um, the new stadium is designed around that. So the, the way in to the stadium will be one of those iconic sort of Wembley-like experiences with the stadium acting as a beacon to draw them in. And maybe we'll even see supporter trains. So, Obviously, with the distances involved in Australia, that's a bit tricky. Um, but if we get um, you know, high-speed rail happening, you know, that can become a reality in Australia, as it is in many other cities in the world. Think about the stadium as a destination for shopping and entertainment as well. So don't sterilise a part of the city, particularly if you're building expensive public transport to get there. What's going to happen when there's not an event on? So have food, shopping, entertainment, um, and that's an example up there of the San Siro. They have stalls that are line the streets on the way in um, that sell all sorts of things, sort of foods and scarves and all sorts of things. Have activities during the game which fit well, the cadence of scoring. So AFL stuff's happening all the time, right? People, the ball's moving. Even if someone's sort of, you know, been punched in the head on the pitch and is getting attention, the game kind of keeps going on. Not all sports are like that, so make sure that the fans are engaged during those breaks. So um, if you've been to a basketball game, they do that really, really well, and basketball is a pretty fast game. Um, if you go to, if you like rugby, 
it can take an age to take a penalty, and it's sort of not the most exciting thing to do, watch someone, you know, lining up the kick and getting their hands in the right position, doing the old Johnny Wilkinson. So think about how to make that more engaging. And then the digital experience should then try and emulate the lounge room. So all stadia now pretty much have big screens, but I'm not sure that they're really used in the best possible way. Um, and we've also got augmented and virtual reality capabilities, and there's some people in this room who are developing those things. But bring that into the stadium, and let's get the clubs to take ownership of that. So they can actually bring the fans on the journey, the pre and post, and keep them stimulated and keep them engaged with the sport. So here's, here's my list. So we talked about the stadia, um, build it in the right place with the transport links. Ideally links at least to a single sport, so there's a single point of accountability for the consumer experience. Um, and if government retains ownership, make sure that the feedback and KPIs provide accountability for that experience. And particularly if the fans aren't coming, it's got it's to be affecting the stadium and the, and the government ownership of that somehow. Um, so integrate the travel journey, um, augment public transport um, where you can, so there's enough to bring people in. Have pre and post game entertainment. Um, and then work on the game. That's the one bit that the clubs and the codes can actually control, um, even if the other things are a bit harder. So make that game more in engaging. So fix the sight lines, minimize dead time. In some cases, clarify the rules. Um, I find incredible in some football games that the crowd don't actually know the rules. Um, so they don't understand the referee's call, so they get upset by it. Now, um, and then the guys in the TV commentary don't understand the rules either sometimes. So there's no reason why that can't be ex explained in real time. Um, and then just make, the, make it more fun. Add music during stops and play. I mean, look at what the Big Bash has done from a standing start. Um, they've taken you know, some difficulties with their sport, addressed those directly, um, and now they're one of the sort of top 10 most supported um, games in the world. And finally, enhance that digital experience. So my belief is there isn't a crisis in Australian sport. It's all about execution. And there's, there's codes that are doing it well, like basketball, that everyone can learn from. But what sports can't do is just take the fan for granted and expect that all of us are going to accept what we experienced in 1988 with uh, warm beer and pork pies. So thanks very much for, for your attention. Um, I will put these slides on LinkedIn. Um, I've seen a few people taking photos, so I'll post them up there. And I think now we're going to move to a panel. Um, yes, we are, Ian. Cassandra. Thank you very much. Please put your hands together for Ian Clark. And uh, while that panel is moving into place, I should just run this past you, Ian. In the 60s, Sydney had trams that ran all the way to Central, mm -hmm. along Anzac Parade in front of the cricket ground and the sports ground. And of course, the New South Wales government at the time, in its infinite wisdom, decided that cheap fuel and cars was the way to go, not public transport. Mm -hmm. So we live and learn. Uh, we move on, an opportunity now to welcome back uh, one of our favourites um, from the uh, Mitter Ellison Group, the Senior Associate Cassandra Heilgren. She'll be moderating, and in fact, with that in mind, take the microphone and please introduce your guests, the subject, back to the stadium. How do we improve the match experience? Thanks very much, George. Um, and we'd like to welcome our panellists today. We've got Ian, who you've just heard from, Kate Roffey from Wyndham City Council, Anthony from Alive Events, Andrew Westercott from Australian Grand Prix Corporation, and Gavin um, from PGA is also joining us on stage. Uh, we only have a very short amount of time to go through this panel, so we're going to um, be very succinct with everything we address today, but thankfully we've got the lunch in the networking lounge where we can um, pick the brains of our panellists a bit more. 
Today, today we've heard um, from Kylie about Marvel and then Ivan with what La Liga's doing, um, some really positive experiences we are seeing worldwide and Ian's addressed um, some of the issues I guess we are facing here in Australia. Um, thankfully it's not all bad and our panellists today have some great experiences that they are able to share and hopefully we can start to um, move uh, people from the home experience back to the stadiums and I guess more bums on seats. So Anthony, I'll start with you. Um, you've worked with some amazing brands throughout your career, Cricket Australia, Australian Open, Formula One, AFL. So what are your clients wanting to actually achieve with their big events and their stadium experiences? Sure. Um, look, I, I think it, it varies um, enormously depending on what, what the code is. Um, for example, we've worked with Cricket Australia on creating a national uh, entertainment program for the One Day Internationals, and that was uh, that had several objectives. One was to build up some live content around the Above the Line campaign, which was um, summer's uh, biggest dress-up, uh, and in that they were trying to reach a broader audience, they were trying to appeal to uh, the family market and also creating a, a value-added experience um, in stadium around the country, and that involved um, programming some local and international talent as well as some kind of festival-like content. Um, Tennis Australia, a little bit different. Our, our involvement there has been creating excitement around uh, the actual on, the ticket on sale dates, uh, and that was a, a large-scale media uh, stunt where we had you know giant oversized tennis balls raining down on every major building in Melbourne um, to, to, to create some awareness and excitement. So um, I, I think it really does vary, but ultimately it's, um, it's either to drive ticket sales or to drive a, a greater fan experience. That's it. I saw some of the Tennis Australia people here today and it certainly was a great campaign seen, seen everywhere, so it certainly did its job. Now, Andrew, you've got a bit of a different experience and I guess so do you as well, Gavin. You don't actually have the stadium experience, so to speak. But when we look at the Grand Prix, Prix, Prix Corporation, we are getting those consistent t statistics and increase in numbers. So what are you doing to maintain but also increase that e engagement? Yeah, we operate two events. We operate MotoGP down to the circuit at Phillip Island, but uh, the big event, Formula One, is actually in a park and it only turns into a Formula One venue for four days a year. And so what we've got to do is we've got to create all the things that Ian was talking about and we've got to do that in a very, very competitive landscape in Melbourne and that competition and what the fan actually wants is to be entertained. You know, the big opposition for us is the television, the lounge room experience, and especially for a sport like motorsport where you get so much of the statistical information and, and what's happening, we need to create a better atmosphere at the circuit, and we do that. There's 21 Formula One events around the world, and Melbourne has a reputation for being one of the best in the world from a promotional point of view and an experience point of view. And with the new ownership of Formula One, what they're doing now and now is making sure that the venues and the locations that they're going to have Formula One tend to be centred around cities destination locations, because we're actually bringing 28 to 30,000 people interstate to our venue, about 12,000 from overseas. So they just don't want the experience in the venue, it's the experience in the city and it's the end-to-end -end, um, excitement that they want, and uh, that's where you've just got to drive a very competitive outcome and a very exciting outcome for them. And Gavin, yesterday we heard a lot about that with the PGA and, and the engagement that's taking place there. So can you talk a bit about it from, from your perspective, getting, getting the fans from home back to the field? Yeah, what we've had to do is um, <clears throat> create, you know, our stadium is 18, 18 holes of golf, but we've had to, to go for, for all the different markets, all ages, and we're a traditional sport. But, you know, uh, four years ago we built a strategy and took our events back in-house and you know, one of the things was a kids' day on Tuesday, 300 uh, kids coming through on a My Golf um, program. But we've built out on the 16th hole, which, um, which is quite new. It's like a party hole like they have on the PGA Tour in Phoenix, but it's called our Sonic Million Dollar Hole in One. Um, and that's where it's uh, out of that hole, we've got a DJ. We're going for a different age bracket. It's not traditional. The music pumps during, um, while, plays, while the shot's not being played. And then as the players are coming down to the green, it uh, lightens up a little bit. We've had to talk to our um, professionals, our players, to get them engaged, which, that, which they are. And then around the 18th hole, we've got traditional corporate marquee, um, which is uh, always working well. They can have a lot of fun and see the players finish. And the other thing we introduced this year was the young juniors and the fans can come out and actually putt alongside the... Um, 
the players on the putting green. So it's activation, and that's supported by a new ticketing program as well. Sounds really interesting. And um, Kate, if I go to you, you've got a, a really unique role in all of this, and I can't imagine the number of proposals that would come across your desk. Um, you would have to evaluate a lot of, um, I guess, different events and, and proposals that are coming through. In terms of stadium development and from an investor's perspective, what actually appeals to you? Yeah, so um, a, a couple of um, relevant stadium things. So I did the redevelopment negotiations and the master planning for um, tennis, tennis centre, so where the Australian Open's held. Um, and I spent a lot of time overseas with the Jets and the Giants and the Mets and the Cowboys and Manchester United looking at how they do activations and how they build their stadiums. And I have to say, picking up on a lot of Ian's points, we're very poor in Australia at both, I think, stadium design, certainly stadium economics. I sit on the Melbourne Football Club uh, AFL, for those who aren't from Victoria, board. Um, we share um, the rights to play at a stadium with five other clubs, so our uh, return on investment for playing there from things like commercialisation of food and beverage, porridge rights, those sorts of things is very poor because it's a state-owned uh, stadium there. So having been overseas, um, tennis is a very, very good event. Um, it's a very well-activated event here in Australia now. Um, it is, after a lot of uh, work. Um, I'm out at Wyndham and I'm doing a deal at the moment for the first um, privately funded, purpose-built sports stadium in Australia. So if we're successful with the Western Melbourne Group in getting an A-League licence, it will be purpose-built and it will be privately owned. We are not seeking a cent of state or federal government to actually build the stadium. It's based on value capture. And the reason I'm really interested in that is because it gives us the opportunity to change the stadium economics. It gives us the opportunity to work specifically to develop better spectator opportunities. It is right next to a train station, so it had to be right next to public transport. Um, we can build on a lot of that stuff that's been happening overseas around activation on game day, around fan activation, that just gets left behind when you share a stadium with 14, 15, 16 other clubs and codes that's um, a state-owned facility run by a trust. Before we get into the, the VR and entertainment aspects, I want to ask you, Kate, um, with the privately owned stadium, do you think um, some of the issues that we do see with the state funded, I mean, I work with a lot of agreements and um, my clients are so restricted in terms of food and beverage, what activations they can run, covering up signs outside Suncorp Stadium for, for football matches. Do you think some of those issues will be alleviated if we move to more privately funded stadiums? Yeah, definitely, and that's one of the reasons we do need to go there. So I spent um, legal, seven hour legal meetings twice a week for three and a half years at Tennis Australia negotiating a deal, including the commercial terms. It took us you know, 18 months just to buy back our catering rights at tennis because quite frankly the food was crap because Melbourne Olympic Park and Delaware North didn't care. And I said to our CEO, it's bad for our brand. And he said, oh, we send them, we do a deal with you know, um, the press club up the road. And I said, but people come to the Australian Open and say, this is a crap. Um, opportunity. It's a crap food offering. So that affected our brand. So we had to buy those things back, as you say. It took extensive negotiations to do all of that sort of thing. So if you're starting afresh, of course it'll be difficult. It's not going to be an easy, easy process. But you've got the opportunity to actually do the right thing to start with instead of fighting over porridge rights um, and having to take all your signage out because the Australian Open has a different alcohol porridge rights sponsor to Melbourne Olympic Parks the rest of the year. If you're going to a concert, you drink Jim Beam, you don't drink um, Chandon Champagne. So it, it's really complicated when they're shared facilities. They're not purpose-built, and, and that is a difficulty. So, Ian, if we look from a sponsor's perspective and um, the entertainment value, we're seeing a lot more in terms of social activism. We have players covering up um, certain logos because of religious and entertainment um, beliefs. So what do you think there is in terms of challenges um, from a sponsor's perspective at these stadium events? And are you seeing them move away from wanting that on-field activation because of those issues? Yeah, look, I think there's, there's three elements to this. So there's the fans and what they're up to, there's the players, um, and there's what I've called sort of, you know, activists who, who want to get involved. Um, so I think firstly with the fans, it's, it's sort of, a, you know, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. So if you take the red and black block, for example, and I think they've been fantastic for football, you know, right up to the point where they cross the line. Um, and that's been quite difficult to manage 
without discouraging them. But I think there absolutely is a line there. Um, they have crossed it, um, and the, the consequences were appropriate. That needs, you know, that needs to be baked into the policy of the code. Um, I think with the, the players, it's, you know, we've talked about this a few times, I think players have a responsibility of role, as role models um, around their behaviour. And they need to be educated in that. Um, I've been an advocate of having uh, professional social media people. So if they do send a tweet at two in the morning from God knows where, there's a filter that stops it going out um, and embarrassing them in the, when they wake up. Um, I think the one of the hardest thing is when sport gets sort of involved in politics a bit and activists you know, start trying to use your brand to make their point. Um, I think the only thing there is just to be mindful that um, social standards do change. You know, we used to have the Winfield Cup, you know, it's a cigarette brand, you know, I don't know much about that, but, you know, cigarette brand. Um, we now have lots of gambling in sport um, and, you know, the, the community attitude on that is sort of shifting a bit. So I think you've, sports have got to be mindful that they're part of that environment um, and make sure they, st they stay ahead of that and make sure they protect their brands. All right. Well, let's um, we'll change it, change gears a bit, and turn into the, I guess, the positive aspects of stadium experiences rather than the challenges we're facing. So, Andrew, um, we've spoken a bit about virtual reality in sports, and I've mentioned um, the activations that the Brisbane Heat T20 team are doing uh, with all their on-field and stadium experiences with the the CUA headsets. Where do you see that heading in terms of a new revenue stream and stadium engagement for the fans? Oh, it's, uh, it's already a part of uh, Formula One. I mean, one of the great things about our sport is that technology is so intrinsically linked with it and it gives us many platforms, whether that be leveraging government opportunities on STEM, um, engineering roles in innovation and technology, but specifically on virtual reality, we're seeing it more and more used from a sponsorship point of view where fans can come along and wear the virtual reality goggles and, and perform pit stops on a, a Shell supercar or a Formula One vehicle. We're using it uh, in the future for tourism opportunities to be able to look at the tourism aspects and, and leverage off the history of Albert Park by having virtual reality tours to be able to look when it's not a motorsport venue, which is you know, 361 days a year, to be able to experience what it was like in 1953 when Sir Jack Brabham and the guys were racing around it and there were hay bales in place, to what it's like nowadays with Daniel Ricciardo, Lewis Hamilton and Sebastian Vettel. Then there's also the opportunity, actually, to use it for sales. You know, we're finding more and more that virtual reality and the ability to show the experience in the venue um, is a really important way of captivating either sponsorship opportunities or exploring new ways uh, to get fans interested in our sport. That's it. Um, Anthony, um, we're seeing a more of a push towards the digital activation and we've got the guys here from Populous. We've seen what they've done out overseas with the NHL outdoor stadiums and things like that. Um, we've got the Generation Y fans that we need to engage. We heard yesterday we've got that eight second you know, time frame to, to get them hooked. So can you talk a bit about the major events and what they're doing in terms of um, experience? I think you've got a bit of a show for us for that. Um, I, I think there's always going to be a place for, for live entertainment and it's interesting to have a look at the statistics on the decline of some of the attendances in stadia for sporting and yet if you were to look at a similar chart showing the um, increase in attendances at festivals and at music events it's at an all-time high so it seems an obvious thing to try and find a connect between the two. Um, I, I think of a festival type experience, um, far more um, interactive experience which aren't just based on the fans sitting in their seat. Um, I think they need to get out, out of the seats, it needs to be much more inclusive, much more social. Uh, obviously technology has a, a, a part to play. Um, if I look at a couple of very, very inspiring things recently, um, it's a great example which was done uh, by Riot at the World Championship um, eSports game for League of Legends in South Korea last month. We've actually got a very, very short clip, 20 seconds of it, to show you a great example of bringing live entertainment, augmented reality and the fan experience all together. So I think we've just got a very quick clip to have a look. So 
I don't know whether you, whether you could pick which were the real artists and which were the augmented reality ones, but what was clever is the integration of that. So you had support by a US record label, you had an international US artist appearing, you had augmented reality talent, uh, so you've got lots of funding coming from various pools, a bigger reach, and I know that Riot went on to release um, unique content off the back of that as well. So a great example of integration. Yeah, it really is. You sent that video through this morning. It did take us a few times to work out who was actually singing. Um, not sure if we'll see that in Australia anytime soon. It was but, live. It was but, live singing. But, but, we, but we could. We don't know. So, um, Gavin, if we, we start with you, um, if we could change one thing about game day experiences here in Australia, whether it be something like what we've just seen with the Riot Games, what do you think it should be? Number one, number one change we need to make here. Gavin, yeah. <laughs> Um, probably, you know, the biggest change is to, um, to create an experience, you know, if we're, we're talking players, um, create an experience for the players to engage more, you know, from a golf point of view, the fans just want to get close to, to, the, to the players. You know, there's, there's an event that will take place in, in Victoria next year where the ropes have been taken down on the side of fairways. And uh, the winner of that event last year, and the men and women are playing together. And the fans are getting that close to the players. That uh, Minji Lee said to me recently that one of them was more or less touching her clubs <laughs> while she was her caddy was looking for a ball. So I think, you know, this week at the, um, the beach club, the Oakley Beach Club, out on the 16th hole, we're taking the players out there when they finish their rounds. And we're announcing that and the fans are getting out there and they're not going out to see the golf, they're going out to see the players and have a little bit of fun out there. We take our players through the um, <clears throat> all the corporate marquee areas. So I think, you know, what we said, what Ian said earlier, we've got to get the players um, and the professionals more involved. And Andrew, what about you? Um, one thing about game day experiences, we're looking at a world-class stadium in, I guess, one sentence. What, what do you think we need to... What do you think we need to do? What will we see in the future? Holding me to one sentence, wow. Um, it's very much about the fan experience and it's about, as I said earlier on, making sure that you are getting all the sport and all the info and all the data you need to be able to enrich your experience. And, you know, Formula One, we're on track for about two hours of a 10-hour day. You gotta surprise and delight and give people an experience that they talk about and they take special moments away. Anthony, world-class experience or world-class stadium, what experience do you want? Uh, I think there needs to be um, uh, far more integrated uh, entertainment and, and tapping into global opportunities um, where um, much more high-caliber global content can be delivered at a very low cost. Kate, what about you? Um, I think we don't have a game day experience in Australia, so I've, I've spent time with um, the Redskins, for example. Um, sold out game, couldn't get a ticket. They said we can give you an access all areas pass. What time do I get there? 11 a.m. What time's the game start? 4.50. I said, what do I do for five hours? They said, well, come earlier, of course, if you can, because there's so much to do here um, before you actually watch the game. So we get them in, get, get a pie, get out for security reasons. So we actually have to focus on giving a game day experience because, quite frankly, I can watch it on telly. It's got to be a reason I go to make my way to a stadium, which takes some effort. Yeah, and I, and I know we don't have time, but it, it, if anyone wants to talk to Kate about that um, safety and the risk management aspects, it's something that we were going to address, and I'm sure we'll be able to do it at lunchtime. So just finishing with you, Ian, World Class Stadium, um, what, what's one thing you would have? Yeah, well, this, this is a very um, Sydney-centric view, but it's um, improving the transport. So uh, I, I'm very hopeful that you know, the Wanderers Stadium will be the best rectangular stadium in the country when it's finished and uh, hopefully Allianz gets rebuilt and, and that's, that's up there as well. Um, but, but in integrating the, the transport, it's, it's about trying to do all that in one transaction. So rather than like buying your ticket and thinking, oh, how am I gonna get there? Um, have that as a seamless experience. So you can actually buy you know, your ticket, your transport, book your parking, um, and maybe even order the food and beverage that you're going to get all at the same time. Um, so I think we've got the technology. It happens in other, other industries, other markets. I think we just need to get on with it. 
That's it. And of course, with newer stadium with objects, we've got a, a lot we can um, look to um, now and what we can build in the future. Um, as I said, a lot to get through. Um, I think there's a lot of positives that will come from our stadium experiences. Australia clearly is a little bit behind in, in some of the experience areas here compared to overseas markets, but we've got um, all the potential. And with experts like these, I'm sure that we'll um, see, see more fans back in the stadiums before we know it. So if you could please join me in thanking all of our panellists this afternoon. Thank you, Cassandra. And uh, just something to think about. It's a bit like VAR. It's all about how we implement the experience. Yeah. Thank you very much to Ian Clark, to Andrew Westercott, to Kate Roffey and to Anthony Hample.